So I thought it would be kind of fun is uh, I wanted to share a little bit of our company. Uh, we do a lot of what we call like security software, so I thought I'd share something that uh, uh, is, is kind of in our space. So we make secure communication software. Uh, we can do it through an open source platform. We sell to defense technology organizations and governments, so we're pretty secure. Uh, and what I wanted to talk to you today about was the dangerous secrets of open source. Um, so my goal here is to say, it's interesting for coming a little bit, but we need everyone in the audience and, uh, with a little bit of understanding of open source. So open source is software that's kind of put out there for free. It's like, well, we wrote the software, you can use it. So if you've ever heard of Android, that's open source software. If you've ever heard of Linux, that's open source software. And MacBook is open source software too. And what, I'm going to share with you today you know, some of the dangerous secrets. And what do we mean by dangerous secrets? Um, number one, I'm going to teach you how to blow the head off the Narvik tank. I'm going to teach you how to break into a SaaS service, so any sort of posted service. And I'm going to talk about you know, why everyone needs a, a collaborative security organization. So if you're building software, if you're putting anything online, you really need to think about system security, and we'll kind of get some reason why. So, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in Canada. My parents immigrated from Taiwan. Uh, I was a Microsoft engineer. I got about a dozen patents. I was the head of, some, of Outlook and OneDrive at Microsoft. Uh, I was a part of a company, SpinClutch, that was doing video games, we were funded by Y Combinator. And then I created, I co-created the MapMost Open Source Project. And then we raised about $7 million of VC funding. So, so that's a little bit about MapMost as a startup. And what Batmos does is it does collaboration for technical teams in secure environments. So you think about you know, Outlook. Um, Outlook, when it came out 20 years ago, was kind of revolutionary. It was an email client, it was a rich text editor, it was your address book, and it was your calendar. It was all in one. And today, Batmos kind of does that in secure environments with technical teams. It does audio and screen sharing, it does team messaging, it does release management, instant response, um, and all these different things for, for really strict uh, strict security organizations. Um, we built an open source platform, so about 4,000 people help us, help us build Mavidus. It's translated in 20 languages. Um, and our commercial customers have had that over over $5 trillion in market cap. If you have our public sector, government, and defense customers, they're protecting about $25 trillion in gross domestic product a year. So um, we're in these very highly secure organizations. And I can't, can't talk to you very much about that, but I can tell you, you know, about open source. And interestingly, where I learned how to blow the head off a tank was not, you know, working with Mills, not working with, not in Mavericks, it's actually the video game company. We actually hired, um, we actually hired active duty uh, military officers to advise us on, on how we were building um, our video game. So um, we start, we had one of our, one of our, our head of, uh, of sort of design was actually an ex-Lucas film um, and was a wonderful, uh, wonderful animator. And he would model, uh, this is a, he would, he would do it all computer models, all our military equipment. This was a, a Bradley tank, and he had a built computer model of it, and he had this, uh, this military officer explaining, you know, okay, well, what's right, how do you build it? And uh, there was a point where they said, well, actually, this Bradley tank, you're doing it wrong, there's actually, a, like, this, this diagram of the tank is actually incorrect. Um, what happens is there's actually a lip of armor around the turret of the tank. And they added that lip of armor because in combat they found out a, a, a rocket propelled grenade could actually fall inside the head of the tank and, and blow the head off the tank if it got a lot of shots so they added this piece of armor around it. And, uh, and the Lucas film guy was like, but I can't find any image on, on the internet of this, of this lip of armor you're saying. And, uh, and the army guy goes, okay, hold on, let me go outside and take a picture. So, you know, he, this, is, this, is kind of like the daily, this is kind of like the daily vehicle he had. And what we learned from that experience was actually that the armor designs of this tank um, and of military equipment are actually open source. They actually put the plans out there. The, the electronics are all classified and confidential, but the actual tank armor is not. And the reason why is because, well, if you find a problem in the tank armor, you want to know about it as soon as you can so you can, you can address it. Um, and that's kind of the design, and that was, you know, a use of open source to actually improve the security of these of these vehicles because, you know, anyone can see the armor from the outside. There's really no there's really no confidentiality, so why not put the plans open source as well? So that was uh, a super interesting example. 
Uh, and that brings us to that first sort of dangerous secret of open source, and that is that nothing useful can actually be secure. So this is a really important understanding. And if you talk to security people, if anyone says, hey, this is perfectly secure, nothing's perfectly secure, it's secure because nothing useful can be secure. All useful systems have vulnerabilities. We can reduce the number of vulnerabilities, but we can never actually eliminate all of them. So, you know, real world example, it's like, well, you can add infinite armor to a tank, but then it's going to get really slow. And it's not going to be able to go over certain bridges and certain structures. So you can only move vulnerabilities around. If it's a light armor tank, you're only allowed so much armor because of the weight. As an example, you always have to make trade-offs in design. Here's another, here's another design uh, in software. So if I want to protect myself from a password attack, a brute force attack, which is trying to guess every single password you could possibly have, um, you could add something like, well, three tries are out. You can try three times and it'll lock you out. So we're going to try and defend against that. Well, now you open yourself up to another attack, which is I can lock you out of your own system by putting in three array, like, incorrect inputs. So you'll find this, you can think of this problem sort of offline, but the idea here is nothing is secure. You always have vulnerabilities, you can only move them around. And security is really making, is making trade-offs. You have usefulness, right? Is the product actually going to be useful? Is it going to be a heavily armored tank and I can do less with it, or is it going to have light armor? You're going to have the risks, but what is it susceptible to? And then you're going to have your resources. Like you can, you can continue to design and continue to add things, but you're going to be limited by your resources. So that's number one. Number two, and I had this uh, this question kind of earlier, just before the panel, was like, well, you know, is open source software more secure or less secure than, than regular software? If you have it open, if you have like tank plans open in the world, or you have more the software open in the world, is it more or less secure? Um, and it really it depends on a lot of things, and this is a, a really important thing. Just if you remember one thing from this talk about software, um, it's this: have an RDP. What an RDP is, it's a responsible disclosure policy. What an RDP is 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 a is a basically a, it's an industry standard sort of statement to what any security researcher should know what a responsible disclosure policy is. It basically says we're inviting ethical security research to come and and find issues with our product. So what you're saying when you have a responsible disclosure policy is um, anyone out there who finds a vulnerability, don't go and you know, tell the Wall Street Journal about it. Here's how you send that information to us. It could be an email address, it could be a form you upload, but this is how a responsible researcher will, will tell you about a vulnerability in your system. And anyone who does security research that said this is the ethical way of doing it. And what happens is in that policy you say, well, we're going to look at it, we're going to investigate it, we're going to take it seriously, we're going to have a policy of fixing certain classes of vulnerabilities and pushing out the, the fixes to our to whoever was using the software. And then at the end of all that, we're going to disclose what the what the issue was and we're going to give you credit. So you actually have a hall of fame for anyone that contributes to your to improving your security. So if you can remember one thing from this talk about, about whether you're um, anything that you're doing online, whether, you, whether it's a website or it's you know, software systems, create that responsible disclosure policy so you can get people to ethically disclose security vulnerabilities. That's the most important thing to remember. Uh, and really appreciate those people. What they're really looking for, these ethical security researchers, is, is that they want to be recognized because they're spending a lot of time. They want to make things better, and if you're willing to work with them to make things better and safer for everyone, then you know, that's the most, that's the best use. And then in that context, open source software, where people can see things other than you know, the, 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 front, the front end of it, they can see all the source code, you actually get more security research. Uh, it can be a lot deeper. Um, and as you, as, you get this, as you get these disclosures, you really have to patch and harden and communicate and announce that. As long as you do that, then the contract with those researchers is, is valid. Um, and, and it's all, and it's, um, everything, just, everything works. So in that model of usefulness, risk, and resources, responsible disclosure policy is an investment you make uh, that's going to reduce your risk because you're going to have vulnerabilities um, disclosed to you and you can fix them. Last secret, um, do the right thing. So doing the right thing is, well, we're talking about breaking into systems and all of these secrets. Doing the right thing is, is really about doing more than the minimum. So the minimum is you want to vet your dependencies. Like, what am I building my software on? What am I building my system on? Is it, um, is it secure? The non-obvious thing is you want to support your supply chain. So think about the responsible disclosure policy on the other side. What if you find a vulnerability in someone else's software? So uh, Mattermost, we, we did 
defined a vulnerability in someone else's software. In fact, it was the Golang programming language itself. So Google's language that uh, a lot of people use uh, have a vulnerability in what was called, basically authentication, right? So uh, you say, hey, I'm Ian, like, hey, uh, I'm Ian, I might have access to a system. This person over here, Sally, um, is able to log in as Sally, but she can do something to trick the system to get, to make the system think that, that she's Ian, since she has my permissions. So we discovered this, and uh, and we could fix it. Well, actually, we never actually used it. We were actually considering using one of the Golang libraries. We found this issue, and we didn't use the library, but we spent three months of our time, our security team's time, working with Google, working with all these people that you know, potentially were affected um, to solve the problem. We didn't have to, but when you think about you know, what does it mean to be part of the community in security, not only keeping your system secure, but keeping the ecosystem secure, this was, you know, it was just the right thing to do. We couldn't sort of like not do it uh, just because of how we think about security and research and responsibility. So um, let me, and you know, one of, the, one of the things I said I'd teach you is how to break into, into software. So we're gonna teach you exactly what the vulnerability was. Now here's the thing, this was two years ago, so this is all probably fixed by now. Um, and it's already public, so this information is all public. And what we did is, you know, we, we worked with uh, we worked with Google, we worked with the downstream folks, the people that are using libraries, and we were able to notify people ahead of disclosing the, the issue publicly. Um, so I can talk about the issue now pretty safely. So here's the high level. Um, you know, that everyone knows computer programming, so I'll try to make, I'll try to abstract this. Um, you know, you design something with really heavy encryption and verification environments. That's your design. Um, and the vulnerability that we found is that you know, there was assumptions in how people were using the Golang programming language that you know, there would be an extra verification step after, after, a trans after a translation. So to translate one format to another, and they assumed that, that the programming language would verify, and it did not. Um, so the attacker could basically use that design, that design, um, so to, to use that design to trick systems. So let me give you an example of a real, like this is, this is an analogy, right? This is not, this is not how it should work, but I'll give you an analogy for folks that aren't in computer stuff. Um, imagine you had a ticket, and you could, it was a ticket to machine head, and it was at a certain date, and you got this UPC code, right? So you scan this UPC code, and you think, well, that's gonna verify the information. Um, and what happened was, in this case, the Golang programming language, it wasn't the case. That UPC code and the text on the ticket were, were not the same. So you could say, well, it's not machine head, it's Taylor Swift. And it's not, you know, that's the, it's VIP all access. And you could basically go to a system that was using this library and you could give it that UPC code and it would log you in and you could put in fake information and it could, it could move around your system without permission. So that's an example of what we found. We spent three months um, and, and fixed it with Google. And that's, uh, and, and you know, that's the, that's the third thing to think about, is really how do you participate in the security community um, as part of securing your supply chain? You support, with, if everyone is securing the supply chain, then the whole ecosystem kind of gets better. So if these secrets are new to anyone in the software org, you know, please think about, um, think about empowering your security team, bringing on your security team, up-leveling your security team. If, this, if any of this information is new in your software, please go think about that. Um, expect Everyone who runs software, just expect to have one of Expect a security breach to happen. And, and that's generally a safe way to go because um, it, it does happen, it will happen, it's a no matter how, how, about when. Uh, yeah, and that's what I wanted to share today, Dangerous Secrets of Open Source. I hope you learned how to blow the head off the tank and remember that nothing useful can be secure. I hope you learned how to break into a SaaS service. Um, and understand the importance of having a responsible disclosure policy so you can, you can avoid, you can literally minimize the risks um, that are out there. And I hope that I've made a point on why everyone needs a, a collaborative security team and why it's such an important investment for everyone that uses software. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to connect with me on, on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I'll be around after, I'll be over here for the, the Q&A. So, so thank you so much. Thank you, John. And, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Step Down uh, for a rest. So, our
Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Kai Yang, uh, uh, VP of Product at uh, Lending AI. He is also a founder of a, a, a medical AI company uh, named uh, Medi-X uh, Graph. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Kai on stage to introduce uh, Lending AI. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure to be here and uh, love to share a couple of stories that I've learned with AI for the past few years. Uh, so, my name is Kai. Uh, I'm running the product team at Lending AI. So, what do we do? Uh, in Lending, uh, we build a computer uh, software platform to make computer vision super easy. Uh, the company, a few words about the company. So, the company is formed by Agent E. Uh, for people into AI, probably know Agent E one of the most famous figures in AI. Before landing, he found uh, Coursera, which has told about 6 million people to AI all over the world. He is also the founder of GoBrand and the founder of the Baidu AI team. So one mission when we work together on landing is to democratize AI. And more precisely that uh, is to democratize the Computer vision AI, uh, yet that computer vision for AI. Uh, so why it's so important is because uh, in my previous career, in Andrew's previous career, uh, we have seen that computer vision has been created so much value in my do, uh, in my company, in all the men. And we are really envisioned that this technology, like the modern AI-based computer vision, can be also benefit from other industrial industries, and like everyone. So this mission is very important to us. Uh, so when we get started, so we get started relating with manufacturing, not the most sexy department, but not sector, but for manufacturing. And so we're starting with visual inspection. Uh, so what's visual inspection? Like the idea is very simple. In the manufacturing process, it can be in the middle or all the way to the end, that people put some human or camera to see whether the product they produce, for example, like this form. Have any defect? Is that a good product that we call OK product? Also, product has some defect we call NG product. But this visual inspection process usually has been widely adopted from all the brick fabrication from very large, like steel manufacturing, like making steel rolls, to automotive parts, to the solid state battery that we drive every day, uh, to a small wafer inspection. Like this inspection, visual inspection has been adopted. In fact, this putting a camera in the manufacturing line to detect defects has been there for 20 years. Quite exciting for us. So let me share with you one fun story. When we came to this area of two years ago, the first we learned is actually there are more, more than 50% of the inspection tests today still not human, more than 50%. You can imagine it's a very repetitive test. Human sitting there looking at the same form, the same part over again for whole day. The worst part is the human is actually not very reliable doing this. Human has emotion, you get tired. So statistically, a human only are good for 80% of accuracy for this visual inspection task. That means that some product actually got shipped out to you, to us, with some defect there. So it's interesting that we thought there's a lot more automation happen in this domain, but it's not. Why, why is this? Uh, the reason we found is the computer vision algorithm that run behind the camera was not good enough. It's not as good as a human. But here in Silicon Valley, we also hear that the deep learning, the computer vision for AI is just as good as human. So AI is the solution for this one. Is that the case? Again, two years into this area, we found that this is not the case. Actually, look at all the manufacturing customers that we work, I work with. We found that less than 25% of those AI-based inspection projects really go live. Go live means that the, the AI system is really in production line, doing their job 24-7, generating business value. There are tons of for concept projects going there all the place, but very, very, very few really then production line, generating value, very surprised us. So, 
Why is the case? Right? It's very weird. We see on the research paper here in Silicon Valley, everything goes so well. Why in the real world um, the AI deployment is such a rigor? So I want to share with you two important observations that we found um, called the biggest barrier for AI adoption. The first one is uh, called small data. So here's the thing. All the AI applications that we enjoy today on the, on the internet applications are actually trained by millions, if not hundreds of million data. Even at school, when I study AI, the data set I play has 10 millions of images. But it's not applied to the real world. So here's one interesting survey I did last year in Automate Show in Detroit. The Automate Show is one of the largest uh, manufacturing conference. So there are 400 people sitting here like this. I do a question, a live question on the keynote, said, hey, like, here owner of the manufacturing line, tell me how many images do you typically have for each product which has to be the where AI model can be learned from? The answer is not surprising. The answer is surprising. The audience, usually more than 50% of the, of the manufacturing line has less than 50 images. And this is very, very different than what we learned in school, which we always train with the millions and millions of images. So we draw one conclusion that the technology is the AI practice that we learn from school or we have done uh, from the internet company just cannot apply to this domain. And this domain does not have the same problem, does not have the same logic of which data. This is, this, is the, uh, this is the barrier number one. The number two we found is it's a long term problem. Let me draw something fun for you. <coughs> I said we draw uh, we list all the AI project and we sort it by the increasing order of value of something like this. Right in the head, there will be some AI project like advertisement, like Google advertisement, it's so valuable. Like one AI model worth like $5 million per year, $35 million per year, one AI model. Right? Web search is another important AI model in the head. This is what I know. Uh, Andrew told me, the do is generate $2 billion value per year. This is why Andrew can put 300 data scientists machine engineer to work on this single web search model. Unfortunately, if you look at the long term, like pharmaceutical company uh, try to inspect pill, right? uh, steel manufacturing try to inspect steel roll, or semiconductor company try to inspect the wafer. Right? Those long term projects, there are many, many of them. They are very different from each one. Inspect one centimeter pill, it's a bit different than inspect one micrometer uh, semiconductor defect. Arguably, we found that this long term combined together should have higher value than the, the head one. Unfortunately, each product is just so small so that our customers have this problem they cannot fund, right? they cannot put four people, four very expensive data scientists into a project to detect the event. Right? Even, even in the one very high value project in Web3, we can put 300 people in a one model. So our solution to look at this area is over vertical platform, uh, so that we can enable uh, our users in the particular vectors, particular verticals, uh, to uh, build a model and using the word data-centric approach, uh, which we want to introduce later. So how we do this one is for landing for the people for the low help vertical who want to adopt computer vision and do not have talent. They are scientists or resource, they are scientists, machine learning engineer. What we do we offer a platform, a software platform called Lending Lens. It's a super easy to use platform. It's a call based, a call based. Everyone can come in, you don't need to worry about your GPU, you don't worry about your software installation, and start using it in one second. It's no code platform for so that like, you don't need to have the user doesn't need to have a deep learning or machine learning training to really use this platform to get the production level model. Ready. And then we also take off deployment, all the very, very old deployment that deployment on the cloud, on the edge, right, on the very cheap GPU device or on a very high duty machine uh, server can help that. So uh, uh, I want to share with a few couple real examples we have working with us company. Uh, uh, this is one uh, China, uh, a steel manufacturing company from China. Right, the idea for them is try to inspect steel roll 1.5 meters 
the speed is going for like one seven meter per second speed rolling. Before they put in, before they put in the AI system, there are two people at the end of the production line before the before the steel got rolled into a roll. They look down to see if there's any defect. Oil spot, if it's scratch, if anything, the guy or the girl click the spot to, to mark where the defect is. So they use our system to help to put the camera at the end of the uh, production line and do the automation inspection. Really help them to reduce the number of people sitting, the perfect people sitting there to do this job also make the product quality much, much higher. The other example I want to share is actually a company, uh, FAB, a US-based FAB. So what they do is, in addition to know whether the wafer is good or bad, it's very, very important for their downstream uh, process to know why this wafer is not good, right? Is this wafer not good because of a scratch or is some residue in the wafer? You can imagine that would be a very important information for the upstream process engineer to find the process. So again, they license all tools to help their team, their science team, to start building the system to put a camera up, to microscope camera and do the analysis. We help them to reduce their 36 people you know, to a day job um, doing this classification of the images, totally reduce that, to auto auto automate that, and save all the costs for them. Uh, but these are all the customers that have been using our platform to enable their team to build competition uh, solutions in very, very skilled. I want to share with you one technology behind the platform that we are building uh, is the data center AI. I believe one of the previous uh, speakers also mentioned this. So the idea is very simple. In the AI system, the way we build it is there are two parts. One is code, right? one is data. The code is the neural network. The neural network always going to be used. The data is the data we train in that model. So traditionally, this is how we do it. School. Right, we fix the data set. The data set wants to do competition, we fix the data set. We go in to find the best AI model, to the hyperparameters to get the best result. This is kind of what we do. But this does, uh, does not apply to the real world. In the real world, the situation is, is more like we fix the code. Right? All we say is good enough. What's really matter is the data quality. And then so, so so the approach we did in the platform is we fix the code of all we say have all the tools to help all the people to work on the data. I want to double click on one of the examples that I shared with the previous uh, steel manufacturer. So actually this is the company, two years ago when I team worked with them, uh, they have been working, trying to repurpose the human to do the inspection for a long time. What, so they collect about 4,000 images with, different, with 32 different, different types. So you hear scratch and oil spot and they really need to use this information to grade their steel with steel quality. So what they have been working on is have someone building their model try to get a good result um, for this inspection. So what they got for six months is getting 72% accuracy. So they invite my team to use our tool to help them. So actually it's a good experience we did. So one thing we do is we do I call it data central approach. I asked one of my engineers, say, hey, this was all the images, let's not do anything. Let's find all the state of art AI model, try to apply to it, to see how it works. Maybe this match AI model would just be much better than the baseline one that we have. So unfortunately, after spending me about 20,000 US dollars on the AWS, AWS computation wheel, we kind of almost get zero improvement on this one. Luckily, at the same time, I have another of my team, I asked them to do different approach. We asked them to actually stop worrying, stop worrying about the model, but really get the subject matter expert for this, uh, for this steel manufacturing, come to work with the team. They spent two weeks to really clarify, classify, clarify what are important defect, what are not important defect, what are the images that we are really care, what are we do not care. And in two weeks, two to three weeks, actually we easily get the result from 76 percent to 92 percent. This really from our belief that we found, wow, it's a, it's a much, much better approach to make sure when we design the AI system, we not only have the machinery engineer or the AI scientists get to the model, 
the banking model, we found that having a, a platform, a data center platform, where people focus on the data, has much, much better ROI uh, to get results. Uh, as, as, as I said in the beginning, the Oracle is really democratizing AI. We believe computer vision is not only we who have the computer vision or the machine learning background uh, can use, can enjoy. Everyone can enjoy this platform. So, uh, February last year, all companies decided to open up our platform. If you want today, go to our website, lending.ai. On the left corner, you will see join for free. You can freeze in one second, create. <coughs> Create an account and start building your company vision project. And uh, one more thing for my wrap up. <coughs> so many of you probably enjoy the ChatGPT moment for the past few months. And the fundamental is the fund foundation of that is the large language model, or the language model, the foundation model for language. It totally changed how we interact with companies. I can share with you on the computer vision side, the same thing is happening. That, that uh, yeah, people, we start using the large foundation model for computer vision. It's going to totally change how we interpret, how we interact with computer, and how we build computer vision AI model. Well, next Tuesday, upcoming Tuesday, Andrew is actually going to have a live streaming event to share what of the latest uh, development that I think has been doing for six months, past six months. Visual, visual property is totally going to change how we do combination. Can I see too much here? Uh, I'll invite you to join the, uh, the, the, the 30 minute live streaming next Tuesday. Oh, really miss the last slide. Thank you. Uh, I'll be here if there's any questions.
of individuals, but if they want to adopt it at scale, then you want to have features like user management and you know, workflow and things like that, then they have to buy the bigger version. Um, and then they have to buy a subscription to your commercial version. And the way you make this model work really well is you want to make sure that there are two different audiences. There's a end user that likes your free stuff, and they'll adopt it, and they don't really care about the enterprise feature. And then you have the enterprise product which really appeals to IT and CIOs and has all the management things. So um, that's the way I design it. So public companies are interested in learning more. You can look at GetLab or HashiCorp and read their S1s. Um, this is the open core model and it's the one that a lot of companies are adopting. Thanks. So similar question I will ask uh, Kai. Uh, uh, lending AI is also a data century AI uh, computer vision platform for customers, right? So uh, nowadays, many of us, uh, many of the company want to use the power of AI, uh, but they've never uh, done before, and probably it's, uh, don't know how much it's closer to maintain a team or, or building a model themselves. So how do you communicate with uh, your customers? Actually, a great question. This is actually one of the things we learned for the past two years a lot. Um, every company adopt AI in very different stage. Some companies are very advanced. Some companies are like, ah, uh, give it a try. I don't know. Chicken egg situation. So the thing we learned working very well is try to make this model as usage based or consum con consumption based. The more you use, the more you pay. The more value you see, the more. It's very, very hard for AI company to have a business model like one feed, maybe half million and if it is only penny, it's a very, very difficult business model. So I think all the AI company, even we see today, going for the you know, cost of usage based pricing, we pay. So the, the, the mature customers who use a lot, see a lot of value, can pay a lot. For the people who just try to get started, it's not blocking them. Working for a startup company or having uh, found a startup company, uh, you are providing service that uh, never existed before. Uh, what's the most uh, challenging thing when you are trying to uh, engage a new customer as a company? Pay the most Yeah, I think it's probably going to be different for, for our different products. Uh, for us, we have a big source and we're used by engineers or lots of people. Uh, very often, they've already discovered the open source, they've already used it, they've already tried it, um, and they're coming in, but when they start talking to us, it's usually not the end user, it's actually the IT person over here, who's like, all my engineers are using Mattermost, uh, now I've got a certain size, I need to buy an IT license, um, and then they want to know about, uh, you know, okay, well, what's the, how much is pricing for this, and, you know, can you take the contract that we have on our procurement desk, so very often, when we engage with our customers, it's, you know, they're moving from the open source product to the paid product, right? The open source is kind of out there, we do support, we do build it, what we sell is our paid product. So people are moving from our free product to our paid product, and that's our typical way of engaging. Um, so that's probably a little different than, than folks that, that aren't existing customers moving on. Uh, but that's probably, the, that's probably 80, 90% of our business is word of mouth, is people adopting it. Um, and then the 10% of the case, people, are, and, and there's maybe a 10%, 20% case where people are like, well, you know, I, I, hear all these, I hear all these other customers that are successful with that and those, and they're not technical, but we have this problem, can you tell us about it? So that's the, that's the, but that's the very case. Those are the kind of, um, that's just more business, it's a little different than being open source business. How about kind of into the challenge? For AI, it's very, it's very different. So, um, so there, are, there are three categories I see. First one is if if our customer or user already know that they have a competition problem to solve, easy to you know. But just there's a bunch of customer do not know they need this it's hard to sell. So I think there's no surprise here. The surprise for us, AI is the third one, that a customer has been burned by AI before. And AI was a possible. Let me just share with you a story. Uh, on one of the three to Detroit last year, uh, I fly with Andrew. We made a CEO and eventually, she, after shaking hand, the first word he said is, ah, another Silicon Valley AI company come to fool us. This 
this is how much they got burned before, and we had to come in to tell them what AI can do, can now do it with the bad means. But you can see it's very convenient, it's not going to go well, but you see the first world is a physical Can you tell us some of your, your most interesting or most successes, you know, case, you know, customer case stories? Yeah, I think one that's, um, so we do a lot of uh, defense and uh, government and, and tech companies, uh, so we have to kind of rely on them telling the story. So once, to, so to, to share it publicly, um, one that, that is public is sort of Air Mobility Command, the U.S. Air Force. So um, the U.S. Air Force has used Mattermost. Um, it started with the developers, um, and it's gotten, and so it, it's gotten, you know, kind of popular, and they started building applications on top of our communication platform. So Air Mobility Command U.S. Air Force um, uses Matamos for electronic flight bags. So if I wanted, you know, before they used to have 75 page fighters, you have to like, you know, show them back and forth in order for plane take off. And now it's all done electronically. All the plans are done electronically, all the plans are shared. Um, they can send messages or sort of back and forth, confirm things, sign off, e-sign. Uh, and you know, that just has dramatically transformed how quickly uh, and efficiently they can work. So before, you know, you might only have 30 minutes uh, before the plane takes off to review the flight plans and, and, the, and the physical flight bag. And now you can get over two hours with our system because everything done, is done digitally. So you have a lot more time to find to find issues, to to solve problems, um, and everything moves uh, just just far better. So that's just one example of uh, hey, you've got the communication platform. What can you do with it? You can build workflows um, that really increase your your reliability, increase your speed. And That's a very proud of this function. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, a lot of folks are, yeah, absolutely. So I believe the uh, more uh, interesting story happened in the AI area <laughs> with the Kai Sirius. Uh, yeah, I, I think for us, is a song, like the, the one you remember most is the first customer, right? the first big success. For us, is one of the large solid state battery company. Uh, the story is this, right? they originally tried to build the same platform like themselves. They want to do AI, they know they want to do the competition to help them to do the process improvement and later on the manufacturing process especially. So what we're coming to tell them, hey, you know, you are the manufacturing company, you should not build your own software, right? it's, it's, it just doesn't make sense. So we take a lot of conversation, communication to, help, to start helping them to realize that right, we can help them AI part, you, your customer, focus on the manufacturing of the battery. That's where you got to do that. And we see from the early, like, very thoughtful conversation, now today, this year, we see the unbundling all platform of 100 million inference per year. Right? We're seeing how this AI technology really helping their scientists systematically understand their process. And now their full uh, production start, real, uh, start using these, uh, we use the word repurpose the human special test, repetitive special test, this is really satisfying for me. And for us, is like these customers, they are manufacturing customers, even if they are Silicon Valley based, they just do not have machine learning engineer like to do this job. And then having a using a simple platform really help their scientists, like, which really with science and using the platform to do the computation test. That's, that's, that's the most important part to me personally. And uh, uh, I think AI and security is a possible for these few years. And uh, uh, well, I wonder if you can using uh, the technology from the other side to help your business. I am can you using AI in your business uh, um, or, or, or product? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, for us, there's this technology chat GPT, and for our communication system, system, um, a lot happens in chat in real time. So, you know, how do you take that information? So there's different use cases around summarization, right? And how do I bring in the conversations as well as the data? Uh, and we've just last, just this week, um, we announced a partnership with a company called Ask Sage, which is founded by the former chief software officer of the US Air Force. And they're using machine learning and AI uh, to augment the conversations inside of Mountain so that people can increase the, the speed of communication, the speed of decision. So, absolutely AI is, uh, absolutely AI can 
is being leveraged. So how about Akai, do you, your companies, how you, how your company trading about the security? Um, not security per se, but I can share a fun story about communication. Um, a project that we feel horribly, which I can share here, is to avoid anyone from the AI, is working with a customer, they have a spec of, I want to expand this one. Right? So we take the images, we take the spec, and my engineer team start building the AI model for the next three months. To concentrate it without talking to anyone. And three months later, we sign off this project, our customers say, no, it's not what I want. A lot of things change. Communication is very important here. Uh, I think people laugh. I think we were doing AI probably suffer from this one. So one thing we learned is for the AI project that will regenerate business value, not only the data scientist, not only the machine learning engineer, the sergeant data master and the decision maker of finally code this what is useful to generate value has to be in the loop continuously. Cannot be the only sign out person. We learned this in the very, very hard way that when the other side is, hey, leave me alone, give me three months, I get a 99% accuracy, we call precision result, come back, this is not what this team wants. It's a very, very easy thing. The, the, the engineering team look at the magic that we care, forget about the big picture. Um, so this is actually one reason we build this platform as a cloud-based a cloud platform is where everyone, the manager, the decision maker, the subject matter expert can all log into a single place to look at the progress of the project, to communicate, to change, to change course. So for uh, other uh, security uh, cooperation uh, tool can be helping, you know, across the company that can help in uh, the project and the cooperation in the company. Uh, so, you know, working for a startup who must be quite uh, sensitive about the uh, outside financial environment. You know, the, I think the, uh, from early last year, um, you know, the financial environment become worse. And uh, this year, recently, we heard something like the uh, second government uh, collapse. Uh, so would you share us uh, what uh, you feel about the current outside fundraising yeah, the, um, so the funny story that, you know, SVB melted down, and as it was happening, like, it was just like chaos in the startup community. Um, so we had two banks, we always have a, so for us, you know, we have a uh, finance institution that's covering our cash reserves, and then we have an operating bank, and we don't keep them together just for safety, like, you know, just uh, learn that in sort of safety industry. Um, and SVB was our operating bank, because they actually had pretty good operations. We didn't have, we had less than 10% of our cash, like, at SVB. Um, but when it was sort of melting down, we were opening up, because uh, you know, we went to regional banks, we actually went to the Bank of America to, to get like a systematically important bank, right? So that was a safe one, and it was like Friday, right? And like every startup is like, it's like there's lines everywhere. It's like just all these, all these, and like all the you know, Chase and, and, and Bank of America were just like packed with like startup people, you know, desperately trying to open accounts. Um, and uh, it wasn't that bad for us because we didn't have much cash flow operations. Um, but I remember the person that was sort of behind me, uh, kind of like, went up to him and basically said, it's like, I have a check for $100 million that I need to cash right now. And, and that's how bad, and then, and then we end up, uh, yeah, and, it's, and that's just like an example, right? And I, I told it to, we got connected with the open account for us, and it was, it was good. We had good people who helped us um, kind of move around things. Um, and then I told her the story, and she's like, oh, the biggest one I've had so far is 150 million. So it's like there's multiple. So when SVB was, was kind of you know, melting down, people were doing withdrawals, and we couldn't wire them out, so we just take cashier's check. So it was, you know, this is one of those things where you know, you have to tell your kids like, what it was like on that day. Um, and uh, surprisingly, you know, things have bounced back pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> There was a, it's funny, with the panel that just, just before this one, which was on like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, right? I'm kind of like, and the rest like, well, what's the purpose of like, of like you know, cryptocurrency right now? What's the use case? I'm like, well, the banks just melted down. It's not a bad use case. So um, the funny environment, I think, is it's, I think it's really interest rates. It's less than everything else, right? Interest rates are, are going up. The cost 
the capital is going up, um, and just mathematically, like less capital is available. You can actually look at you can look at the fundraising, you know, markets and things like that, um, and it's tighter now. At the same time, you know, it's some of these, some of these uh, moments in our history is when the best companies are built, right? Because it's only the very best deals that are getting funded. It's only the biggest opportunities. So I think um, it's it's going to be harder, but that also means we're going to have less competition. So I think that's how we're doing it. Yeah, uh, I remember Andrew uh, write a, a strong uh, letter about the uh, civil environment uh, collaboration group. Uh, Kai, do you Because we did not sleep for two days. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Um, so I, let, uh, I cannot comment. I was talking on the investment, but let me tell you a fun story on the AI front on investment. It's a bad joke. An investor would like to hear this. Um, before, when I pitched my company, or when lending when we pitch. All investors look at our slides, look at the numbers. They do not play all through with it. They say, ah, we are building for industry. You use a, a testimony or tell us how good you are. Now with the chat GPT come out, like, yeah. ah, suddenly AI can be assessed, really assessed for everyone. It's the first time all investors really <laughs> approach him. Yeah. Touch the AI product and it's all. So this, so this, this is a big thing. It's a great change when you start asking, hey, can I play with a tool? Can I really see how good this is? Usability, and then changing me. That is a very high bar. Uh, so I think the joke is, before all investors, all investors probably look at slides, like they determine what they don't invest. Now, they invest in AI product. Now they can play with the AI product, like ChatGPT. All the investment become very, very hands up on the tool. So I think that uh, time is uh, close to the end. Uh, before uh, conclude today's uh, panel, uh, I would like to two of you uh, to ask you if you can give any advice uh, to who are uh, interested to start uh, their own company or join a startup company. Any advice? I think you're starting a company. So we were, you know, my, my, my background was at Microsoft, right? It's like a giant company. I do technology, but I didn't really do it. I didn't do a startup. One of the things I found was most powerful was uh, Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, um, has a bunch of essays on how to start, start a company. So I think reading those is probably like the most important thing. If anyone's coming from like, a bigger company or just hasn't done this before, um, Paul Graham's essays uh, are number one. And, and we ended up you know, uh, getting funded by White Home, a video game company. Uh, and it was really, uh, and, and there's nothing they really teach you in White Combinator that's not Paul Graham's essay. So that's how important like, that, that material is. So I'm going to be kind of one of these advice on the founding of company. Um, anything but joining a company? Uh, yeah, I think if you want to join a company, you know, a joint startup, I think the important thing is to have sort of like a five year outlook saying like, you know, I'm committed to doing startups for five years or, and just be okay with that. And be okay that like if the company you join fails or, or doesn't see the work out, then you're still on that path, you're still going to make that investment. I think you can kind of make that commitment on you under your trajectory. And, and knowing that like once you join a startup, you actually be more employable to other startups. Um, I think having a longer term view is going to lead to more successful outcomes in a shorter term. Well said, well said. Uh, just add you one more. Uh, it's my first star. Uh, for star, you got to love how you build. It is going to be painful. It's very painful. Right? So it's always up and down. And in the down, it's the only thing to keep you awake, uh, keep you move forward, is you really love how you do. You believe this is the problem you try to solve. The reason I said this is because recently I get stars see a lot of people in Taiwan. Start putting some API, using API for the ChatGPT. I say, wow, it's very exciting. I want to have a company doing this. Talking to them, you can imagine some of them do not really have a passion of this problem. This, to me, it feels very dangerous, right? Because you're all up and down. Right? In the downtime, you've got to believe this is a problem that you really deeply care about and want to solve. Otherwise, you don't give up. Right, uh, that's a uh, conclusion uh, today's uh, awesome panel. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. And uh, uh, the slides for Dr. Kai Yang were not loading up correctly. We actually had three examples. We probably don't have time to go over them. So maybe anybody interested, we can talk to Dr. Kai Yang directly. Thank you. Yeah, that's a game without two speakers. Uh,
over to Mr. Guy, the two uh, speakers, our chairman, Brian Penn. Mr. Ian Tian. Thank you. And all speakers who is still here, please come to stage. We'll take a group photo. All speakers, 